Hello, and thank you for joining the Pituitary Network Association's webinar program, which is brought to you through the support of our sponsors and our expert contributors. The PNA is dedicated to educating people with pituitary disorders, their families, and their health care providers. The PNA is a nonprofit organization that relies on the support from our members and donors. During the webinar, feel free to type in questions at any time, but please note that all questions will be saved until the end of the webinar. We have allotted time to answer as many questions as possible. Today's webinar, Endoscopic Pituitary Surgery, Reoperation versus Radiation, is being presented by Dr. Theodore Schwartz. Dr. Schwartz is the David and Ursel Barnes Endowed Professor of Minimally Invasive Neurosurgery and a Professor of Neurosurgery, Otolaryngology, and Neuroscience at Weill Cornell Medical College, New York Presbyterian Hospital. He is a Director of Anterior Skull Base and Pituitary Surgery, Co-Director of Surgical Neuro-Oncology, Director of Epilepsy Surgery, and runs a fellowship in Minimally Invasive Brain and Pituitary Surgery. He specializes in the treatment of brain, skull base, and pituitary tumors and epilepsy using the latest techniques in minimally invasive endoscopy, microsurgery, and brain mapping. Dr. Schwartz received his undergraduate medical degrees from Harvard University, where he graduated magna cum laude. After completing his residency and chief residency at neuro, in neurosurgery at Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center, he then pursued advanced fellowship training at Yale New Haven Medical Center. He is also the director of a basic science laboratory investigating epilepsy using novel brain imaging techniques, which is funded by the NRH, where he has served on several grant review committees. He has also received several awards, including the General Giant Award given by the Pituitary Network Association for his excellence and dedication to the field of pituitary surgery. Dr. Schwartz, thank you so much for your involvement with the Pituitary Network Association's webinar program. There's going to be a brief delay as we change presenters, and Dr. Schwartz, you should see on your end to accept. Okay, how's that? That's perfect. I can see your screen. Your sound is great. If I go like this, you see yep. it full screen? I do. Great. Looks good. All right. It's all yours. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today, and uh, I look forward to talking to everybody about some of our experience with recurrent pituitary adenomas, uh, tumors where we've done surgery or someone else has done surgery, and for whatever reason, the tumor has recurred either a hormone-producing tumor or a non-hormone-producing tumor, and sort of what the significance of that is and, and how we treat that. So uh, let me see if I can advance my slides with a button of some sort. Hmm. Let's see what I can do. For some reason, my slides are not advancing. All right. Hold on a second. I guess I can just go like this. Okay. So um, I work at Cornell, New York Presbyterian Hospital in the Brain and Spine Center. And um, an outline of what we're gonna talk about is what is the rate, first of all, of failure of surgery for hormone producing tumors? What is the rate of recurrence for non-hormone producing tumors? How do we prevent recurrence in the first place? And then what is the success of reoperation? What is the rate of regrowth? And what does that mean about um, our necessity of doing radiation therapy? So if we look at the literature, the published literature on failure rates um, for surgery, the, the rates are anywhere after doing a gross total resection of a tumor between seven and 33%. So they're a little bit all over the board. Uh, and for growth hormone, 10%, ACTH 13, prolactin 20%, non-secreting 26%. Um, and then even more importantly, the regrowth after incomplete tumor removal occurs in up to 75% of the of cases. So that's the published literature up until now. I'm gonna show you our own data and it's actually quite a bit different than the published literature. So that's one bit of new information that we're gonna be presenting and some of it's not even published yet. So, if you look at the success of pituitary surgery, and this was a meta-analysis we did years ago on endoscopic pituitary surgery near, the, near its infancy, but it really hasn't changed that much. The success rate is about 80%. Our cure rates for removing tumors are, is about 80%, regardless of whether it's a non-hormone-producing tumor 
or whether it's a hormone producing. These are rates of hormone resolution. And this number here, 0.8, gives you the um, uh, like an 80% rate. And if you look at different types of surgeries, uh, on the top you see ACTH, then growth hormone, then prolactin. It's about 80, 85%, pretty much all comers. That's the success of surgery uh, for hormone producing tumors. And if you look at, at non-hormone producing tumors, and what predicts how good we're going to, how good a job we're going to do, how good a job we're doing extended resection. This was a paper we published in Pituitary a couple of years ago. The things that were significant were the preoperative volume of the tumor, so bigger tumors, you know, harder to get out. This thing called NOSP grade, I'll talk about NOSP a lot. That means whether the tumor is invading into the cavernous sinus. And the farther it invaded in, the less likely we were going to get the whole thing out. Uh, and for Looking at extended resection 100% or gross total resection, really the only thing that mattered was whether it was in the cavernous sinus or not. So if the tumors invade far into the cavernous sinus, we're le less likely to get them out, but pretty much every other non-hormone producing tumor, we can get out pretty well regardless. So what are the recurrence rates after you do surgery on a tumor? Now this is looking at our data. So this is more modern data, endoscopic, minimally invasive surgery done and this is only patients I've operated on with greater than five years of follow-up. So you have 190 patients, and we follow these patients out. And what you see is that after gross total resection, the rates are extremely low. And that's that black line on the top left here. And I'll show you the actual numbers. And after subtotal resection, it's a little bit higher. But even after subtotal resection, it only gets down to about 75%, meaning that only 25% of patients will have a progression of their disease. Most of the patients, even after subtotal resection, will not have progression of disease. And if you look at how many of these patients after greater than five years need any kind of treatment, so just because your tumor occurs doesn't need needs to be treatment, doesn't mean it needs to be treated, that number is extremely low. So after gross total resection, it's that top black line, almost nobody needs treatment. And after subtotal resection, about 25% of the patients will need some kind of a treatment. And that's after about 10 years. This number on the bottom, 150, is 150 months. So what are the predictors of recurrence after surgery? Well, we talked about NOSP score. NOSP 3-4 predicts that you're more likely to recur. Uh, the size of the tumor seems to make a difference, although it wasn't quite statistically significant, but greater than eight cubic centimeters seem to predict that you were more likely to recur. If your KI-67 is high above three, we'll go over those numbers in more detail. That has to do with the growth rate of the tumor. So tumors that grow more quickly are more likely to recur. And then finally, um, revision cases were slightly more likely to recur as well. So if we summarize the results of our series, after gross total resection, the probability of recurrence after five and 10 years was around 4%, 4% at five years and 4.7% at 10 years. But the probability of requiring treatment for recurrence was about 1%. Uh, so that's really remarkable. And after 10 years, the probability of requiring treatment after we have a gross total resection is 1.6%, extremely low. Now, of the patients who got a subtotal resection, so these are the ones who invaded the cavernous sinus but didn't take out the whole tumor, six of our patients, which is about 10%, got radiation therapy right away. And that worked. Those patients did not progress. But there were 90% of the patients, 57 patients, where we didn't do any radiation, we just watched them. And the chance of their disease progressing at five and 10 years was 21 and 24%, and the chance of them needing any treatment was about 20%, 17% after five years and 21% after 10 years. So what does that mean? Should everyone with residual get radiation because the six who did didn't recur? And the answer is no because only 25% of the patients with a subtotal resection actually progressed and needed treatment. So we were able to save 75% of our patients from getting any radiation by not doing it right away. And the ones that progressed, we ultimately gave them radiation, so it really didn't make a big difference in the long run. And what predicted growth after subtotal resection? Well, tumor in the cavernous sinus, we've talked about that. A residual tumor greater than a centimeter, so the size of the tumor that's left behind. Um, revision cases were more likely to uh, grow than first-time operations. Um, so 
The question is, why do we fail? What's the problem? Why do we not get them all out? And, and why do people in general fail to get the whole tumor out? So one is that you can leave microscopic tumor behind attached to the gland. You can leave microscopic tumor behind attached to the dura. You can leave bulky tumor in the cavernous sinus, the clivus, the supracellular cistern. If you use an endoscope, you're less likely to do that. But a tumor like this, you see there's a huge tumor. It's wrapped around the carotid arteries. There's a supracellular extent. It's taking up the whole clivus. You could imagine this tumor would be challenging to, re to remove. And I'll, but I'll show you why with an endoscope, um, we can do a great job. However, we do know from the work of Ed Oldfield uh, and others that, that if we can take a microadenoma out in one piece on block resection, it's less likely to recur, we're more likely to cure it. So the key surgically for a surgeon to prevent recurrence in the first place is to try to find that plane around the tumor. Now, if the tumor is abutting the cavernous sinus or the dura, sometimes those microscopic tumor cells will invade into the dura and into the cavernous sinus. And if that's the case, we actually have to remove some of that surrounding dura. This was a study done by Laws showing exactly that. The bigger the tumor, the more likely it was gonna invade into the surrounding dura. So how do we prevent these recurrences? Well, we do an extracapsular dissection. We find the plane of dissection and make sure we get around the tumor. So here's an example of that. This is a pituitary surgery. The pituitary glands right in front of us. There's a tumor in there, but it's hiding inside behind a very thin rim of normal pituitary gland. So we cut open the gland and we find the tumor where we expect it to be. And we just work our way around it. We do it very careful, uh, dissection, we find the pseudo capsule. Uh, there's a little bit of bleeding, but it's really not that much because everything here is magnified dramatically. That tumor is probably, you know, three millimeters in, in diameter. And once we work our way around it, if we can get the whole tumor out in one piece uh, without leaving any small pieces behind, you can see the normal pituitary gland there in the background, then we know the patient's going to be cure cured and their normal pituitary gland is going to work. So there's that tumor and we're going to take it out. Here's another example of a surgery. We're trying to take the whole thing out in one piece. Uh, you can see we're dissecting it free from the normal pituitary gland. And in this situation, the tumor actually broke up a little bit, so we had to go back in with an endoscope and remove the residual bits of tumor to make sure we get the whole thing. But we still try to find that pseudo capsule to get the whole tumor out. Um, and here we are with an angled endoscope looking up and taking that pseudo capsule out from the undersurface of the pituitary gland using a 45 degree endoscope, just showing you the value of the endoscope and seeing that residual tumor and how we get that out. Here's another case of a small uh, tumor in the middle of the gland causing uh, Cushing's disease. So here's an example where we have to uh, open up the dura first. We're gonna expose the pituitary gland, but we have to get into that tumor. We have to find our way into that tumor, it's in the middle of the gland. So again, we have to open up a little window in the pituitary gland in order to make our way into that tumor. Once we find it, then we start to work on that pseudo capsule, uh, and we do that bluntly, not sharply, to preserve the tumor to make sure we get it out all in one piece. It takes a little bit of time and some delicate dissection, uh, but if you can do that successfully, you're guaranteed to um, get gross total resection, and then of course you're less likely to have a recurrence. Since we're talking about recurrence, the key is how do you prevent recurrence? So this is one way to prevent recurrence, which is to get whole tumor out in one piece. And histologically, you can see that pseudocapsule around the outside. There's the tumor uh, standing for ACTH and the post-op MRI scan. So what about um, tumors that invaded the cavernous sinus, supracellular tumors? How do we get those out, those big giant tumors? And that's about using the angled endoscope to look into the cavernous sinus. We published uh, papers on this as well. Here's an example of a tumor that's invading into the cavernous sinus. You can see the tumor is uh, wrapped around the carotid artery here. And um, let me just advance that. I can't point and advance. So this is the video of the uh, surgery we did. We're opening up the cavernous sinus and first taking off the uh, bone over the cella, and then we're gonna look, work laterally and expose the whole cavernous sinus, take the bone off the cavernous sinus. And surely we'll use a Doppler to find the carotid artery. And you see it's pushed very, very far laterally by the tumor, which means that we can sharply open up into the front wall of the cavernous sinus and remove that tumor. 
uh, from just in front and around the carotid artery. We can open much farther over than we would think that we could because we know where the carotid is and the carotid's been pushed very far laterally. So here we are with angled instruments working in the cavernous sinus and very soon you'll see the carotid artery exposed and we're gonna take the tumor out using angled endoscopes, angled instruments from all the compartments of the cavernous sinus, uh, supralateral, infralateral, inframedial, um, and then pack it off with gel foam uh, to get hemostasis. Here's a post-op scan. So what about this giant tumor that we saw in the beginning? It's invaded supercellar, it's invaded the clivus, it's wrapped around the, the carotid. Uh, this is a case we again do with an endoscope. First, we harvest a vascularized nasal septal flap for closure. We assume there's going to be some sort of a CSF leak. We open up the bone, which is very, very thin, uh, and then find the carotid arteries to make sure we stay away from those. Open up the dura. We start internally decompressing the tumor, and uh, the uh, arachnoid will eventually descend, as you see it doing there. We start to work lateral to get the tumor out of the cavernous sinus, um, keeping the arachnoid back as best we can. And then we start to work inferiorly. Uh, we can put some patties in there to keep the arachnoid out and then work inferiorly and then bring our angled endoscopes in so that we're basically coring out the clivus here. We have to make an inferior uh, incision just behind the eustachian tube through the basophingeal fascia and work infralaterally into the clinoids uh, using our angled endoscopes to get out the rest of the tumor. So post-op, you see we've managed to clean all of that out. Um, and that's uh, essentially a radiographic dorsal resection of that enormous tumor. So what about intraoperative MRI? People talk about intraoperative MRI, how helpful it may be to do surgeries, is it necessary? So we did a meta-analysis of the literature. We looked at gross total resection rates and compared endoscopic transphenoidal surgery, that's ETTS, which is this top line, compared to microscope plus intraoperative MRI, endoscope plus intraoperative MRI. And basically we found no difference that the intraoperative MRI really didn't make a difference. Using the endoscope by itself was about as good for all tumors as the microscope plus the intraoperative MRI or the endoscope. So if you're really good with the endoscope, you may not really need the intraoperative MRI. However, for macroadenomas, uh, we found that adding the endoscope plus the intraoperative MRI seemed to give a higher gross total resection rate than the endoscope alone or microscope plus intraoperative MRI. So, for the biggest, biggest of tumors, it may make a difference. Um, we couldn't show statistical significance because of the uh, literature that had been out there and no direct comparisons could be performed. But that really is sort of an unknown area that needs to be explored a little bit more. Um, but in most people, hands who are very facile with the endoscope, uh, the intraoperative MRI may not add as much as we think. And we, we spent some time using the intraoperative MRI uh, in its early stages and really abandoned it when we started to use the endoscope more uh, optimally because we could see so much more with the endoscope, we thought we didn't need the intraoperative MRI as much. Um, so what about the results of reoperations? How well do we do in a tumor that's recurred after a prior operation? So here's an example of a patient who had a microscopic transmittal surgery. They left a lot of tumor behind in the supercellar cistern. We were able to go back and take that out. So the endoscope can clearly help if an endoscope hasn't been used in the first operation. Uh, this is a, a young girl I operated on to develop gigantism, and so she had a, uh, a tumor-producing uh, growth hormone, and she had a prior surgery that was done with an endoscope, but they didn't get the supercellular tumor out. Uh, for some reason, they didn't do an extended approach. So um, you can do a reoperation, and if you're uh, slightly more aggressive than the first surgeon in the first operation, you can go back and extend the opening. This is just the prior opening. We're extending that above. You can see the uh, fluorescein stains for your spinal fluid. And we're going to open up and do a supercellar approach uh, to the uh, supercellar sister. And you can see the optic chiasm above. I'll just point to that. Oh, interesting. I can't use the pointer and get the movie to run. But I don't know if you can see this little hand here. But here's the optic uh, chiasm. Here's the tumor below. We're opening up the arachnoid. The gland is below and we're gonna dissect this tumor free from the optic nerve uh, and then dissect it out of the bottom of the third ventricle. Here we're using a little bipolar to cauterize an attachment uh, to the optic nerve and you know, retracting upwards on the optic nerve to make sure we don't cauterize the optic nerve itself. 
using sharp dissection to cut that attachment, and continue that dissection, and then remove the uh, supracellar tumor. And we were able to cure this girl of her uh, uh, growth hormone producing tumor and cure her of her gigantism. So that was uh, beautiful uh, impact and wonderful outcome for this, uh, for this girl. So if you look at the literature on um, reoperations for recurrent or residual tumor, and we did a meta-analysis looking at our gross total resection rates using either a microscope or an endoscope, we found that gross total resection rates were a little higher uh, for the uh, endoscope. Those rates were about 53% for reoperations, so not as high as first-time operations, which are around 70 or 80%, but better with the endoscope than the microscope, and um, endocrine remission a little better, visual improvement much better, 73% versus 50%. So more evidence that the endoscope really does help even for reoperations. We looked at our reoperations for residual recurrent pituitary tumors. We had 41 patients, 22 had prior microscopic surgery, 19 had prior endoscopic surgery. And what we found was our gross total resection rate was a bit higher than published literature, about 60%. And if you look at gross total plus near total, near total being greater than 95% resection, we had a 93% rate of getting that high. And the average extent of resection was about 94%, so very high, even for reoperations. And what, what lowered our rate was really the patients where the tumor was uh, not or grade three, four invading far lateral of the cavernous sinus. Endocrine remission, we got in 78%, which is really quite good for reoperation. Um, with a couple uh, additional ones by adjuvant medical or radiation therapy. So if you failed prior surgery and you have a hormone-producing tumor, it doesn't mean that more surgery will not cure you. It can. It just depends on where the tumor is and whether it's accessible or not. Uh, and visual fields also can uh, improve quite a bit with uh, reoperative surgery. CSF leak not very high, only one case, 2.4%. Uh, didn't need a reoperation, just a lumbar drain. New DI, 5%. New hormone insufficiency in 10%. So in conclusion, with the use of extracapsular dissection, extended endoscopic approaches, the risk of failure and recurrence is lower in the modern era than previously published, and we're, we just submitted that paper. It's in revision now. Hopefully that'll come out soon. Reoperation is safe and effective if case are, cases are chosen carefully, and that we did publish. Obviously, a close collaboration with neuroendocrinology, radiation oncology, and a multidisciplinary board are important to, to determine the best treatment strategy. Um, the final thing before I say goodbye is just this idea that, that uh, subtotally resected tumors uh, don't necessarily need radiation right away. And we may be able to, to delay that radiation, and many of those patients may never need it. And if we delay it, there may be a good portion of them, in our hands it was 75%, who never ended up needing treatment even after a subtotal resection after 10 years. So that's just something to bear in mind that needs a little further investigation. So thank you very much. Uh, I don't Excellent. know if there are any questions. Thank Amy, you, Dr. Yeah. Schwartz. Yes, uh, I do have a question. Would a papillary craniopharyngioma be included in your non-secreting tumor numbers? No. So these cases I'm showing you are just pituitary adenomas. Um, I have a whole different, many different publications on craniopharyngiomas. It's a different tumor type. It's a different type of surgery. Um, we've published several articles on them if someone wants to look them up. But but this talk was specifically about pituitary adenomas, not about craniopharyngiomas. Okay, thank you. And you mentioned um, that in some cases you can wait um, and not do radiation. How long would you wait um, to determine whether radiation was needed? Yeah. So I'd wait to see if the tumor grew. And if it grew more than about 25%, uh, I would probably radiate at that point. Okay. Uh, thank you for your presentation and congratulations for your results. I do have a few questions. Do you think the higher recurrence rate of prolactinoma is related to previous medical treatment? When the pituitary is in front of the tumor, is there any reason to divide the gland horizontally instead of vertically? And do you use intra intrathecal fluorescein in all of your EEA? Yeah. So the first, I'll answer the last question first. We don't. We only use fluorescein if we're going to put a lumbar drain in anyway. So in many patients, we do not use fluorescein. But if we have a giant tumor where we're putting in a lumbar drain because we're worried about CSF leak, we'll just put fluorescein in there because we have the drain anyway. Um, in terms of opening up the gland, some, you know, if you really need to open the gland, I find a single incision vertical doesn't necessarily get you enough visualization. So I tend to take a little rectangle 
out in order to see enough. So it's vertical and horizontal, uh, because otherwise you're just retracting on very thin uh, normal gland. It's not going to work anyway, and you're maybe more likely to bang, uh, break into the tumor, and it won't come out in one piece. So uh, both of those. And I think there was a first, there was a third question in there that I. There is. Not. The other question is, do you think the higher recurrence rate of prolactinoma is related to previous medical treatment? Um, you know, we haven't noticed a higher rate of recurrence for prolactinomas compared to other hormone producing tumors. Um, and in general, in terms of treatment, we tend to take patients off their treatment for, you know, a month or two before we operate on a prolactinoma. Um, but we haven't noticed a higher recurrence rate, and those can be taken out on block as well. Okay. Um, I have a 14 by 20 pituitary adenoma. I was wondering if you could maybe tell me what type of surgery I would need if it's invading the ca sinus cavity. Um, can you repeat that question? Yes, I have a 14 by 20 pituitary adenoma. I was wondering if you could maybe tell me what type of surgery I would have to have if it's invading the sinus cavity. So I'm not sure which sinus they're talking about. There's the sphenoid sinus and there's the cavernous sinus. Um, I would say though, in general, regardless, it's the same answer. Um, in terms of what surgery you need, you know, we do transphenoidal surgery. So you need to have a uh, transphenoidal surgery. You need to find a surgeon who does more than, I would say, at least 25 of these a year who's good and has been doing it for at least three or four years um, so that they're, uh, you know, have enough experience. And then in terms of microscope versus endoscope, the truth is, you know, you want to go to a surgeon who does a good job regardless of what tool they use. You know, in my hands, I do a better job with an endoscope. That doesn't mean there aren't other surgeons who can't do an equally good job with a microscope. Um, when you put all comers together, I think the endoscope has slightly better data for, for big tumors, but for small tumors, and honestly, 20 millimeters is not that big, it's kind of medium-sized, I think you could use either a microscope or endoscope. If it's in the cavernous sinus, then you will see it better with an endoscope. So I would say if your tumor's in the cavernous sinus, as opposed to the sphenoid sinus, you need to go to a skilled, experienced endoscopic surgeon who's done a number of cavernous sinus tumors, because it's challenging to do if you haven't done it before. Excellent, thank you. Um, what is an acceptable morbidity for this procedure? Um, so I guess we can define morbidity in different ways. Um, and also you have to discuss morbidity based on the size of the tumor and location of the tumor because it's gonna vary. So if you look at all comers, the rate of, for example, carotid injury uh, is gonna be less than a half a percent or 0.2%. But if you look at only tumors that are wrapped around the carotid artery, um, that risk may be higher in that subsection of tumors. If you look at rate of CSF leak, that's also less than 1%. Um, and that's probably true of any size tumor, because the bigger the tumor, the more likely you're going to harvest a nasal septal flap or do a more complex closure. So that's the accepted morbidity less than 1%. Risk of hormone uh, loss is going to depend on how big the tumor is and how bad your hormone function is preoperatively. Very often, if you have poor preoperative hormone function, you've lost a lot of hormone function, you're not going to get it back, and it may get worse, as opposed to having normal hormone function. And if you have a giant tumor, you're more likely to lose your hormone function than a small tumor. So that number is going to vary widely based on the size of the tumor and what the preoperative normal hormone function is like. And then DI, same thing, uh, size of tumor is important, location of tumor. Um, but the rate in a small tumor should be very low, and obviously it goes up with a bigger tumor to somewhere around, uh, it can be as high as 5% for, for larger tumors. Okay. Um, do you use image guidance during surgery, and can that be a substitute for intraoperative MRI? So we do use uh, image guidance. I don't think it's really a substitute because as you're operating, everything shifts. So we, we do use image guidance, um, and it can be helpful. I think you know, advancing a 45 degree endoscope into the cavity and looking around is more valuable than image guidance. And uh, in our hands, that works to more or less replace the intraoperative MRI because we can ex inspect the cavity in, in so many different angles. 
I know plenty of surgeons use intraoperative MRI and just are not as good with the endoscope and the results are not as good. So the intraoperative MRI is not really a heal-all panacea um, for getting out more tumor. It really has more to do with the skill of the surgeon and their skill in using an endoscope to look around corners to get out those giant tumors. Excellent. Okay. What about regrowth for symptomatic Rathke's cleft cyst? Five years post transferoidal hypophysectomy. Symptoms resumed five weeks ago, extreme headache and some visual disturbance. Regrowth post surgical from three millimeter by two millimeter by four millimeter to five millimeter by six by six as of April 2009. Well, I think, you know, if your symptoms came back, they're similar to the symptoms you had before, the Rathke cleft, Rathke cleft cyst is growing, then you're maybe due for a reoperation. We don't have a lot of other treatments for Rathke cleft cysts other than surgery. So probably the best bet is to go back in and, and have it taken out by an experienced surgeon. Uh, do you utilize a 70 degree scope for any of your cases? Yeah, it's an interesting question. So. Never, really never do we use 70. We go from zero to 30 to 45. Um, I don't find the 70 that helpful. Okay, if there is a CSF leak, how long will you wait till you go back to repair? And do you use antibiotics for patients with CSF leak? So um, for a CSF leak, we, so it depends, I guess. So I would say, if we put a nasal septal flap down and there's a CSF leak and we do an MRI and the flap looks like it's in good position, then, uh, then I would put a lumbar drain in because that flap will get sucked up by the lumbar drain. You won't take air in and that will work. Um, if you have a CSF leak and there's no nasal septal flap, then I think you have to reoperate. You have to go back in and, and do a better closure because the lumbar drain is just gonna suck air in and that will uh, be worse than before. Um, if they start leaking, uh, yeah, I would start them on antibiotics. I presume that everybody with a leak is going to probably develop meningitis. So um, I do treat them. And if they have any symptoms, I'll try to do a lumbar puncture first to get fluid so we know what organism it is if we think they're developing meningitis before fixing it. But, um, you know, the rate of CSF leak after pituitary surgery is incredibly low. Incredibly, it should be less than 1%. Ours is 0.8%. Uh, that's our rate. We looked at a thousand cases and, and that was our rate. So it's pretty uncommon. Great. Okay. Thank you. What's your routine antibiotic prophylaxis for uncomplicated EEA? ANSAP. Okay. How often you, would you repeat the MRIs when monitoring non-functioning adenomas? So we do a three-month scan. Then we do an annual scan for three years. Then we do a five-year scan, a seven-year scan, and a 10-year scan. So one, two, three, five, seven, 10, and 15. Excellent, okay. Uh, I don't see any more questions. If you have questions, get them in now. Um, excellent information and excellent questions, you guys. <laughs> this has been great. Um, I don't see any more. Oh, when do you operate on prolactinomas? That's a great question. So, um, you know, most prolactinomas are treated with medication up front. However, um, there is a subset of patients who either do not tolerate the medication, they get upset stomach. Uh, there are patients where we take the medication and the tumor continues to grow, the prolactin doesn't come down. Uh, and then there are some patients who just don't like taking the medication. Um, for that last scenario, um, it has to be a tumor that I think I can cure. Right, so if a patient says, well, I don't think I wanna take medication all my life, I have to know if I'm gonna do surgery that I'm gonna cure them of their prolactinoma. Otherwise, they're gonna to need to take medication regardless, even after surgery. So in that situation, I like to operate on patients who have tumors that are not at all in or near the cavernous sinus and tumors that are not too big, so I don't think they've invaded the, the dura too much and their prolactin is not super high in the thousands, but maybe just in the couple hundreds. Those are cases that you're more likely to cure with surgery. And so that's a reasonable case to do uh, just if someone says, ah, I don't want to take medication because your rate of cure is going to be higher than someone who might have a prolactinoma in the, in the cavernous sinus. Okay. Do you ever use metal turbinate mucosa over nasoseptal flap? We do not. All right. That looks like any more questions? 
Okay. Uh, Great. Excellent presentation. Thank you so much for taking the time here. Oh, how My big pleasure. is how oh, wait? How big is the problem of pituitary tumors? It's a good question. How common are they? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So, the tumors are pituitary tumors are very common. They're probably the most common tumor type uh, brain tumor that, that exists they, in you know uh, in your lifetime. Around five or ten percent, some say twenty percent of patients will develop a pituitary tumor at some point. Um, now, we often find small tumors on patients who uh, don't have any symptoms. And the other question is, what do you do in that situation? And if it's a small tumor, we usually follow it and wait until it grows or until it causes symptoms. So, you know, in the general population, it's pretty rare. Obviously, if you specialize in pituitary tumors like I do, you see them commonly. But overall, they're uncommon, even though they're one of the most common uh, tumors, brain tumors that we deal with. Uh, brain tumors are a pretty uncommon problem in society. Okay. Um, when do you operate on a prolactinoma as a first option? So, uh, again, we, you know, we discussed patients who, you know, I present patients with both options. So if it's going to be a first option, it has to be someone I think I can cure um, and or someone who is like completely going blind and so you really can't wait for the medication to work or have an apoplexy, something like that. But for a smaller tumor, if I feel like I can cure it, then I talked to the patient about the two options. I said, look, if you take medication, this is what you're going to face. You know, you're going to be taking the medication probably the rest of your life, although 25% of patients on medication will be cured. So you may be in that group, but if not, this is something you'll be dealing with. Um, and if we take out the tumor, this is the risks of the surgery. This is the chances I think I can cure you. And I just give them the numbers and I honestly let them decide when I first see a patient. I let the patient decide because both options are reasonable, assuming that the tumor has a high chance of being cured with surgery. If not, then you're just sort of leading them on. But uh, I very often, let the patient decide. And most patients, and I tell them, I say, look, most patients just take the medication. And I say that to, to, to them and, and the reasons why. And often that's what they choose. But sometimes they don't. Sometimes they, they want to be cured. They want to get it out. Sometimes women who want to get pregnant don't want to deal with being on the medication during their pregnancy and the risks, the, the potential or the low risks uh, of that or, or the apoplexy or the tumor growing during their pregnancy and they just want it out. Um, and if it's a small tumor and I feel like I can save the normal gland with a very, very, very high certainty, then I'll, I'll take that on. Okay, excellent. Do you have any rule of thumb about how high prolactin will be and will be due to stock effect versus prolactinoma? Yeah, you know, the rule that I learned when I was training was that 50% rule. Um, but it's kind of like, uh, you know, if it's, if the, the, if the, if the prolactin, it also depends on the size of the tumor, I guess is how I would put it. So if you have a small tumor, or I would say this, if you have a large tumor and your prolactin is 150 and you have a big tumor, well, if that whole tumor is making prolactin, it's gonna be higher than 150. So that's most likely stock effect. You know, if you have a big tumor and your prolactin is anywhere uh, below 150, it's probably stock effect. If you have a small tumor, gets a little more complicated because you can have tumors that are small and the prolactin's not that high. You can have mixed tumors where not every cell is making prolactin and it doesn't go that high. So it kind of depends on the size of the tumor. But 150 you know, is roughly a, a rough cutoff of uh, stock effect versus prolactinoma, but it's not exact. Okay, would you recommend radiation if high level of IGF-1, double the norm, but no tumor, maximum smodulin and maximum somavert? Yeah, I mean, if you've maximized your medical therapy, uh, you know, peg this amount's another option. Make sure you've tried everything. Um, but if medication's not working, then radiation is more than reasonable. The, heart, the, the, the problem is you gotta radiate everything because you don't know where the residual tumor is and you will become hypopituitary eventually, but those other hormones are replaceable. So it kind of depends on your age and whether in you know, a couple of years you're willing to take hormone replacement for the ones you lose for the, from the radiation. Okay, how are tumors cured through medication? You mentioned 
yeah, they just shrink away. You know, the, the dopaminergic agonist is so effective that it, uh, all the cells just die off and they don't come back. And that's only prolactinomas. Nice. Okay. Uh, why mostly functioning pituitary tumors secrete anterior pituitary hormones and not the posterior pituitary hormones? You know, that's a great question. That's a really great question. Um, I do not know the answer to that. Uh, why the posterior pituitary uh, doesn't create, well, I guess I would say this, you know, the, the posterior pituitary hormones are not made in the pituitary gland. I guess that's really the reason. They're made in the hypothalamus, and then they travel down the stalk and are just released in the posterior pituitary. So um, that may have something to do with it. But it's a great question. I, you know what? I'm not a, a complete expert on that, and that's a, a terrific question for an a endocrinologist. Uh, when operating, does shape and size of the no, nose have any effect on the procedure? And thank you for the great presentation. Oh, sure. Um, you know, usually not. You know, we've, we've done these surgeries on, on children four years old. Um, there have been occasional patients that just have, you know, very bad, horrible um, developmental abnormalities that have deformed their faces or they have, they have overgrowth of bone um, with congenital abnormalities that just make it impossible. But I would say that 99% of patients over the age of four can undergo this kind of surgery. Okay. Uh, does Salivert ever stop tumors from growing? You know, I'm going to defer that to an endocrinologist. Uh, I'm going to try to keep this focused more on surgery because I'm more of an expert on surgery. And uh, I work closely with a neuroendocrinologist. And the reason I do is because they know more about the medical treatment of pituitary tumors than I do, just like I know more about the surgical treatment. So it's a great question for an endocrinologist. Okay. Uh, how common is anosmia after endonasal procedure? It's a good question. Um, it's going to depend on whether a nasal septal flap is harvested or not. Uh, we cite rates of about 5%. It may be a little higher with a nasal septal flap. Um, if you don't harvest a flap, you're less likely to get anosmia. Um, some patients who you really don't think will get it will get it. Some patients who you think might get it end up not getting it. So there is a little bit of vagueness in that due to, you know, inf inflammation that can occur. Um, but I would say somewhere around 5 or 10%. Okay. Would you remove a 6 millimeter Rathke's cleft cyst on a 13 and a half year old with bone age delay and delayed puberty? No, I don't think I would. Um, I don't think I would. I don't think that the Rathke cleft cyst is going to, create hypopituitarism. If the hormone studies are all normal, if they've gone to an endocrinologist and all the hormone studies are normal, um, I don't think removing that's going to make a difference. And if the hormones are low, you can always replace those hormones. Okay, excellent. Uh, there's a couple of thank yous. One from Australia, excellent presentation, and greetings from Chile as well. So we've got uh, quite the group today from all over the world. I don't Great. see any more questions, and I know you have to get to the ER, so um, we'll end it here. Thank you so much for taking the time out, um, Dr. Schwartz, and giving this excellent presentation, and thank you to all who are viewing. Oh, wow. Greetings from Kenya. Thank you. No, so, um, awesome. wow, worldwide audience today. Uh, we you. appreciate you all taking the time in your various time zones to join us. Um, this concludes today's webinar presentation. We appreciate you taking the time to join us. If you missed any part of this webinar, um, or if you'd like to share it with family and friends, it will be available on our website, pituitary.org, after it's edited. There's gonna be a brief survey after the webinar. Uh, fill it out to help us provide you with the information you need. Thank you all for joining us, and another one from Israel. So uh, definitely worldwide. Thank you all so much. Everybody have a great rest of your day. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you, bye.
to show.